Welcome to Stories of Sacrifice, American POWMIA's podcast, the voice of the missing in action and those that are buried as unknowns in our national cemetery. I'm your host and lead researcher, John Bear. Just a boy turning 17 Took me away from my home in Abilene I was sworn I'm a soldier now I was trained to survive And from a boy I became a man We journeyed to a place called Nan Spent 13 months of living in fear They say it's over, but I'm still here Hey America, can you hear me? Don't you remember me? Welcome, everybody. We're live and ready to go now. Sorry about the little technical delay we were having there, and we got that sorted out. Uh, I'd like to welcome Dave McMillan to the show again tonight. For uh, This is part four. We're going to go over some interesting facts about some missing journalists, and uh, David's going to lead us through all that. Welcome, David. Good evening to all of my friends in the United States of America and hello to all my friends in Australia. It's daytime here in Australia. To all the female and male service people out there that are keeping us safe in the big bad world, I send my love out to you guys. We really appreciate your service. To all the veterans who have come back, we really appreciate your service as well. So today I'm going to be speaking about some guys that went missing in 1973. So uh, last week we were talking about Operation Menu, which was President Nixon's bombing campaign of the sanctuaries inside Cambodia, which was at the time it was deemed illegal, um, I suppose in a similar way to, is being criticized in a similar way to the Iraq with President Bush and legality and stuff. Either way, um, it ended in August in 1973. And at the end of August 1973, there were these two Japanese journalists that were friends with the American female journalist, Elizabeth Becker. And these Japanese guys decided that they were going to learn how to speak Cambodian and go native and go over the other side and try to get a story and secure a pass with the Khmer Rouge. So that's what we're going to be talking about today, John. Yes, sir. I'm looking forward to it. So um, there, there also happens, I also happen to have recovered the remains of a Japanese individual out in this area. So the, the individual that the documentation is talking about, I recovered in um, March 14th, 2010. So I think the part where we're going to start is we're going to start with Elizabeth Becker's narrative about her experience. So there were two Japanese guys. One one guy's name was Koki Ishiyama or Ishiyama Koki in the Japanese tradition. He was the older guy. And then there was a young photographer called Taizo Ishinose or Ishinose Taizo. And these two gentlemen, they studied and... Um, they had a lot of contacts on the inside and they decided that they were going to look into this document that they'd discovered. So I'm going to drop in from Elizabeth Becker's perspective here. So, so now she's talking about her relationship, her friendship with Koki Ishiyama. 
We shared our work and our suspicions about the war. It seemed clear that Lon Nol was losing the war in a criminal fashion. The corruption in Phnom Penh was unrivaled, even in Saigon. Yet, though he detested the Lon Nol regime, Koki kept in touch with politicians, trying to find out why they stayed on and what outcome they could hope for. It was in this pursuit that he came across a small Cambodian book called Regrets of the Khmer Soul, the, the only written record of life with the Khmer Rouge. It was all the politicians were talking about. The author has, had deserted the communists in 1972 and come back to Phnom Penh to warn his fellow Cambodians that the communists were ruthless but would win because they were not corrupt and seemed dedicated to improving the peasants' lot. Koki wanted to believe there was a better alternative to Lon Nol. We pulled our money to pay his Cambodian assistant toy to translate the book for us. It was the basis for my first piece on the Cambodian communists and for Koki's deep curiosity about them. Koki tried to develop a Japanese perspective on the war but felt his home office failed to understand it. I remember his disappointment when Tokyo refused to run his account of the first refugees to appear en masse outside Phnom Penh. He wrote that the sight of the homeless walking through dry clouds of dust on the road to Phnom Penh jogged memories of his own days as a refugee. He had been very young, fleeing with his grandmother from the final bombardments of World War II in Japan. He had felt lost. He had been afraid to let go of his grandmother's hand. He wrote little more than that. For once, he wanted to ignore the politics and paint the bare emotions that were choking the country. But to his editors, the article must have seemed more like a cluster bomb of innuendos. So, um, fascinating stuff here, guys. Two. Okay, at some point, I asked Koki to join and the studying joined me studying the Khmer language. He said that was a coincidence because he and two Japanese photographers, Naoki Mabuchi and Taizo Ishinose, were discussing a similar plan. Koki set up his studio as a classroom, but predictably the photographers learned quickly while we intellectuals never got beyond a basic 200 word vocabulary. On August 15th, the bombing stopped and the American embassy declared victory since Phnom Penh did not fall the next day. Soon Cambodia was no longer a top story. I saw little of Koki. He was planning a trip to Nepal and was worried that Tokyo would consider the trip irresponsible. He wanted a camera and ordered us both automatic idiot boxes from Japan. My last memory of Koki is taking his picture while he took mine. Weeks passed and Naoki told me Koki had not gone to Nepal. The vacation had been the final straw. He had been called back to Tokyo. Naoki said he had driven Koki to the airport and Koki had told him to say goodbye to me. Koki didn't write, but I would not have expected him to. For all of us, Phnom Penh was the suspension of whatever we had called life before. Our friends were made in war and lost with reassignment to real life. Shortly after I returned to Phnom Penh from a respite in Bangkok, Taizo, the photographer, was reported missing in Khmer Rouge territory. No one had been lost for over a year, generally because every journalist had finally realized that the Khmer Rouge meant business when they said that they didn't want any of the foreigners near their zones. Naoki said he thought Taizo had tried to break into the Angkor Temple complex to photograph the Khmer Rouge and win the Pulitzer. By the war's end, there would be more Japanese journalists missing or dead in Cambodia than any other nationality. From a civilian perspective, of course, that is John. There's more yeah. Americans that were killed military, right. but so just continue on here. Okay. One afternoon, I came back late from the battlefield and was told an official of the Kyoto News Agency had come to Phnom Penh to investigate Koki's disappearance. He wanted to talk to me. Naoki told me that Koki had never gone back to Tokyo. He'd gone to the other side, near Kampong Spo. With permission from the Khmer Rouge, Naoki said Koki had felt pressured to make the trip because a Japanese journalist had spent one or two nights with the Khmer Rouge in that area, and his agency felt Koki should be able to at least match that story. 
then Naoki confessed it was not simply competition that drove Koki and he told me the whole story. Our Khmer class had not been what it had seemed. The three Japanese wanted to learn Khmer well enough to cross over to the other side without interpreters to look for the answer behind the war. Koki had not told me because he thought, yeah, because he knew that she thought it was too dangerous for him to, to travel into that into the territory. So it's a very big risk, but a, a big payoff, this type of story, right? Exactly. Yeah, so she, she said she thought crossing to the other side was too dangerous. At the last minute, Naoki had got cold feet himself. I asked the American embassy if they had spies who could help find Koki. They did not. I asked the French expert with connections to the Khmer Rouge for help. He said there was little hope if Koki had been missing that long. I left Cambodia in 1974, about six months before the war ended on April 17, 1975. The Khmer Rouge marched into Phnom Penh and ordered everyone to leave. Three million people were driven into the dry, hot countryside to raise food or die. A few Cambodians Soon, hundreds escaped to Thailand and told stories of starvation, summary execution of army officers, bureaucrats, and intellectuals. The Khmer Rouge denied the stories and resolutely refused to allow in journalists. I did not want to believe the stories. I had hoped the communist cruelty was the result of war and would end with peace, but I read the news articles and become convinced that something horrible was happening in Cambodia. I called the Kyoto News Agency in Washington to ask if there was any news about Koki. And there wasn't. So, John? Yep. Do you have any questions? Yeah, you know, uh, so Koki was with the Coda News Agency, and then he was captured. What was the date on the kids' capture again? So, Koki and, and Taizo went missing at the same time. same time. They went across at the same time together. And... Uh, so that they both went missing on november the 22nd in 1973 they crossed over into Khmer Rouge territory um before i interviewed their guide mr kong vaughan and he was the cambodian who dropped them off at their rendezvous but both of these men went missing at the same time taizo ishinose and um koki ishiyama there was another guy by the name of naoki mabuchi but naoki mabuchi is the guy who helped elizabeth becker try to find out what was going on with the Kyoto News Agency. Uh, um, Mabuchi was supposed to go over, but he got cold feet at the last minute. He survived until old age and he died of lung cancer a couple of years ago. Yes. But um, there was these three Japanese guys and they decided that they were going to get, they were going to get a pass into Khmer Rouge territory. They had communist contacts and they thought that because they were Asian, that they would be treated differently from the Japanese, uh, yeah, from from Americans. So yeah, yeah, and this is after the Cambodian incursion, where the U.S. had already pulled out pretty much, except for some, you know, CIA and mm -hmm. and uh, MACD SOG operations that were being conducted in there. But all yeah, regular no, US yeah. military forces were not in Cambodia at this time. I think the, the there's some heavy duty background noise going on where I am right now, but I'm going to, so I'm going to read some, I'm going to read some more of the, the background to you, John. Okay. Sounds good. So, pardon me. Yeah. Your background noise isn't that bad at all. Okay. Japanese journalist Koki Ishiyama, bureau chief for Kyoto wire service acquired a diary published by Itsarin, a former school teacher in Phnom Penh who had traveled through Khmer Rouge territory in 1972 and 1973. It contained one of the earliest accounts of life under the Khmer Rouge. Koki Ishiyama was an acquaintance of journalist Elizabeth Becker and he shared the diary with her. She in turn wrote a long article for the Washington Post in which she described what Sarin experienced. Sarin wrote, I also saw them force all people to wear black clothes, forbid idle chatter, and severely punish any violations of their orders. Expressions of support for Sihanouk were firmly discouraged, and people were encouraged to spy on each other. Discipline was unremittingly harsh. When the article was published, Becker was harshly criticized for reporting things that she did not personally see. People on the right and left criticized her on the right for saying that Cambodian communism was different 
than Vietnam communism. And on the left, from, from those that believe that she was buying the CIA claims that Cambodia under the Khmer Rouge would become a bloodbath. She explained that she learned enough of the Khmer Rouge secondhand. She wrote, the sum result of my learning about the Khmer Rouge was I never wanted to see these guys up close. If Sarin had joined the movement after becoming disillusioned with Lon Nol and the Khmer Republic, he rose to the status of local leader but left the party and returned to Phnom Penh after nine months. If Sarin's regrets for the Khmer soul in Cambodia, his work, regrets for the Khmer soul, revealed the secrecy with which the Khmer Rouge op operated and the true name of the communist organization, Ankar. The policy of the Ankar was to impose a grim, regime in which hatred for Lon Nol, the Americans, and at times the North Vietnamese allies was assiduously cultivated. In October 1973, shortly after the Becker article was published, Koki Ishiyama and Taizo Ishinose went in the countryside together to meet with Khmer Rouge members. They were captured north of Phnom Penh and uh, it's reported that one of them died on January the 20th, 1974 of malaria. So, newsmen believed prisoner of the Reds, Phnom Penh, Cambodia. Koki Ishiyama, a correspondent for Japan's Kyoto News Service, has been missing for more than two weeks and is believed to be prisoner of the Khmer Rouge, a Kyoto official said today. Katsutaka Kawamoto, Kyoto bureau chief here, said Ishiyama left Phnom Penh October, on the 10th of October to travel around the western provinces for information for a story. Kawamoto said the correspondent failed to return as planned on the 1st of November. Unconfirmed reports said he probably was arrested by insurgent forces near the famous Angkor Wat temple ruins in northwestern Cambodia. Kyoto headquarters in Tokyo appealed by cable to Prince Norodom Sihanouk in Peking, nominal head of anti-government forces in Cambodia, to investigate Ishiyama's whereabouts. Sihanouk replied that he would order an investigation and in case Mr. Ishiyama and Mr. Ishinose were arrested, that his side would treat them in a humanitarian way, Kawamoto said. Ishiyama is the ninth Japanese journalist reported missing in a three-year-old war in Cambodia. Any questions, John? Yeah, that, yeah. tell the listeners a little bit the big difference. You know, They're saying there that they were captured by the Khmer Rouge um what what's the big difference between the Khmer Rouge and uh being captured by BC or NBA okay so so the the when we're talking when I'm talking about Angkor and Angkor Wat we're talking about two different things two words that sound similar to a foreign ear but are very different Angkor means the organization Angkor was the the word for the communist organization in Cambodia and Angkor Wat, it means a grand temple. So, but the words look very similar. So when it came to the Angkor, they had very strict policies, very different policy from the, um, what you would refer to as the Viet Cong. So um, the Angkor, they decided that people would be killed for three principal reasons. If you resisted them, and if you're an expatriate or a local capitalist, a rich farmer, an intellectual, a juvenile, or a monk, or whether you were a member of reactionary groups or you could be connected to reactionary groups such as the CIA or the KGB, then you had to be wiped out. So if any person was reported to have fallen into those above principles, then he or she had to be killed. If they did not fall into the three above principles, then there had to be an order that was sent to the sub-district chief to continue to investigate those parties until they were found guilty. So essentially, um, they were they were very ruthless people, and they 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 knew that they had specified who their enemies were, and they went out of their way to to wipe anybody off, wipe anybody who fit their enemy into their enemies off the face of the planet. So um, the word Ankar, if you send a request to Ankar, it meant to send a request to the regional chief. Ankar to the Khmer Rouge 
it represented something that was right and good, a democratic party, not a centralized democratic party, because a centralized democratic party is a dictatorship. So that their um, overall slogan was, if you want to destroy a banana tree, you must pull it out from the roots or it will grow again. That's right. a difference between the Khmer Rouge attitude and the Viet Cong attitude. The Vietnamese liberation forces were just trying to be able to get their own state, but the Khmer Rouge, they were, they were into uh, genocide and they had a target list yep. of people that they wanted to kill. So, yeah, so they got captured by the Khmer Rouge or the Enka. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, they, they were exactly. So, yeah, they're very, very deep trouble. So, so back to um, the disappearance. Japanese military attache LTC Tanabe has provided us with the following background information pertaining to the disappearance in the Angkor Wat area of the Japanese journalist Koki Ishiyama and photographer Taizo Ishinose after having met three times with unidentified Khmer Rouge representatives in Phnom Penh Ishiyama accompanied by a Khmer assistant who is now in Phnom Penh left the city on October 10th for Udong on Route 5 and from there to the Khmer Rouge stronghold of Amlung northwest of Phnom Penh, where they hoped to contact Khmer Rouge officials. Before leaving, they told friends they expected to remain in the Udong area for about three weeks, approximately three weeks after Ishiyama and Ishinose left Phnom Penh. His Kyoto news agency received a message from him stating that he was proceeding to Angkor Wat. On November 22nd, the Kyoto agency subsequently received notification from Khmer Rouge representatives that Ishiyama arrived at Angkor Wat on November 15th, 1973. This was thus the last word regarding Ishiyama that the agency received from the Khmer Rouge. On December 14th, the Japanese embassy received a report from Siem Reap that the Khmer Rouge were holding two Japanese newsmen, one described as tall and the other short. Ishiyama was tall and Ishinose was short. They are assumed to have been the detainees. On December the 4th, Ambassador Carino received a report that a Japanese journalist had been condemned to death by the Khmer Rouge. During the period between December 4th and 6th, the Japanese Foreign Office dispatched messages to Khmer Rouge representatives in Hanoi, Paris and Peking, asking for any information regarding Ishiyama. Replies stating that the matter would be investigated were received from Hanoi and Peking. A Japanese diplomat also sought information from a representative in Paris, but he was told that they had no knowledge of it. In response to the query, the Japanese Socialist Party received a letter from Sihanouk stating that the Grunk had never killed any Japanese journalists and the matter is being investigated, and that if the journalists are being held, he would order them to be released. Tanabe said a further report from Sihanouk is anticipated in about two months. Tanabe has offered to provide us further information on this matter as it is received so yeah Sihanouk was, was the prince prince Sihanouk was the was the head of the government pretty much exiled when the uh, Lon Oil Noi did Lon the, Noel, yeah yeah okay cool um yeah and he was he was he was in exile in in, in um, China at that China. time Yep. So, um, so yeah, February 1974, information received from LTC to Nabe on the 15th of February 1974 reports now indicate the journalist Koki Ishiyama is now being held by Khmer Rouge in the mountains northwest of Kampong Spew. The Khmer Rouge have indicated through contacts that Ishiyama will be released at the end of March, but that never happened. Okay, so... Um, Maybe we should go through some some documentation, John. Sounds good. Okay, so yeah, I just uploaded some more for you in there too, Thank on the shrine. Sure. Okay, so this is um, part of a an interview that Matt Franjola, a U.S. journalist, did with Hang Peng, who was somebody that worked at this hospital where it is alleged that. Um, Taizo Ishinose was killed. So I read this report before I went over into Cambodia and started to investigate it. And this guy, Heng Peng, he was a deserter from the Khmer Rouge and he went over 
to try to go over to the American side. And he did that in March 1975, which was pretty bad timing. It was just before um, the the Southern Vietnamese lost the war. So um, he and this guy ended up getting killed at Tol Slang. But these are some sections from the interview, which ended up sending us all out into the Paka Dong area. So this Matt Franjola. Do you know where that journalist was captured from? Hang Peng. Five days after he was killed, I learned that he was captured on Highway 1. Did someone talk anything after he was killed? With the communists, nobody dared to talk something about the American, otherwise they would be under the watch. Could you tell me the aspect of that journalist? He was skinny with a long beard, with a full face of beard. Do you know when he was captured? I don't. I only learned that he was captured on Highway 1 and brought to Pakar Dong. Did he speak Cambodian? I don't know because none of us spoke with him. Nobody dared to communicate with him. Not at all. Escort, escorts were strictly forbidden to exchange talk with a prisoner. It was so risky for any Khmer Rouge who talked with Americans. They're even afraid to look at Americans. Was a hospital located at Tabum Kamum district? It was right at Pakar Dong, meaning coconut flowering in Khmer, just in the forest. Where is Pakar Dong? Pakar Dong is in the district of Tabum Kamum. Um, now, did you hear anything about the Japanese? Yes, I did. How long did you hear? Not very long. Sorry. Oh. His face was full of beard. Hard to recognize him. He got long hair, skinny, and was white. Was he the only man you saw? He was the only man I saw. I was an eyewitness during when he got the injection and also when his body was put in the grave. I also heard some information about some other person who had been captured. I was told they were Japanese. Did you know anybody else who was captured beside that American journalist? I learned from the communist headquarters that the Japanese was also captured, but he was beaten to death instead of using the mortal injection. You said that you're at the hospital. Did you see the journalist while he got the injection? Yes, I did. I saw his body. It was taken out of the hospital and buried. How did you give that injection? They gave the first shot with one unit. He wasn't dead. Then we gave him another shot with the second unit. Where did you take the body to? They took the body to the hospital cemetery at Pakar Dong and buried it there. So... I went, I went to this location in the knowledge that I was looking for a grave location behind Pakar Dong Cemetery. Uh -huh. When I went out there, I, I knew it could be this so-called white guy with a long beard who they claim was Sean Flynn that was given a lethal injection. Right. Or it was the Japanese who they said that he wasn't given a lethal injection, the Japanese. He was flat out beaten to death, which goes which it fits with what we have spoken about before with the individual that I found in Kampong Chum in 2010 that we know was lapidated, was stoned to death. So right. this is this is the first lead that put me onto it, John. So you can see is like a, this is the thing that got me into the MIA POW researching in the first place. This was, I was given this handwritten report from Matt. Matt died like two years ago. I was given a handwritten report from him and just those details about those guys getting whacked out there was just very juicy and enti and enticed me into it. Right, right. Yeah. So, um, I, put so I, I just want I want to continue on and and pull up some some documents which will actually let's have a look at some photographs of Taizo. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so this is Taizo. Taizo Ishinose a very, very brave young photographer. Yeah, military issued green tiger stripe. Yeah. Combat BDUs. Yeah, so he certainly, he certainly um, was pro-American himself. So, um, okay, so in January 1974, the Khmer Rouge captured a foreigner and brought him to Pakadong village. They told local villagers that they captured the foreigner on National Route 7 and that he was a Japanese agent. The foreigner was kept in Pakadong village for two days and tied to a pole in the center of the village where, with his legs chained together, 
The witnesses described the foreigner as tall and clean-shaven with light skin, light-coloured eyes and brown hair. The foreigner wore a brown shirt, green trousers, metal frame glasses and US-style jungle boots. The foreigner cried when the Khmer Rouge took his jungle boots and he refused to eat or drink. The witnesses do, know, do not know the fate of the foreigner. So another document, Japanese journalist. So when when you when I'm talking about the clothing that he had on when he went captured when he got captured and he was taken out to that village, this is the this is the clothing that he was wearing. Okay, yeah. the Japanese agent that they captured. Right. So, um, yeah. So we we're we're, we're going to go and have a look at some documents about the transit. Okay, so here, Japanese journalist. At the end of 1972 or early 1973, Mao Fook's messengers transferred a Japanese journalist from where he was captured on National Route 1 to the Eastern Region Headquarters at Pakadong. The Japanese journalist was killed and buried near Pakadong. Hem, Hem Sam Kai knew more about the incident but has since died. Source did not believe the stories that the journalist was given a big meal prior to his execution because there was little food to spare. Further, he did not believe that anyone in the village of Pakadong would know anything about the Japanese agent. Villagers were not permitted into the eastern region headquarters as far as he knew. There was no cemetery at Pakadong and the bodies were buried. outside the, the time of the incident okay okay so at the time of the incident the region did not have a security organization the region only had a system to handle captured military personnel only district party organization had security units at that time the region committee decided to send the prisoners to the closest security unit which was the Tabum Kamum district security headquarters at Trapang Rasay. the prisoners were then transferred to, to Trapang Rasay source saw the prisoners when they were in his messenger office in Orang O. He did not see them in Trepang Rasay. Source was sure that the Eastern Region Command did not inform the Vietnamese of the capture of the foreigners. At the time of the capture in 1973, there was animosity between the Khmer and the Vietnamese communist organizations in the Khmer communist region. Therefore, it was very unlikely that the Eastern Region would have reported the information to the Vietnamese. The chief of the Tabong Kamong security unit was Tarsabong. Mum Sabung was hated by villagers who lived under his rule in Tabum Kamum because he was brutal and he was known to have killed many people. He's a very well known war criminal, Tarsabun, in, um, in Cambodia. So, yeah, he was he is known to have killed only over 1,000 ethnic Cham people in the area. If he was still alive, he would have known what happened to the foreigners when he died in the 1980s. Mum Sabung was buried in the Prain to Kaur Pagoda in Kampong Chum City. He was not buried in his home village because his family was afraid that the local villages in Tabum Kamum would desecrate his grave. Japanese description. The Japanese were both skinny, about 1.7 metres tall and about 21 years old. They both wore glasses and had green backpacks. Saw some eyes they were Japanese because one appeared older than the other and they allowed the younger looking of the two to eat first. Source had heard that this was something that the Japanese did. Um, he said that they both wore glasses as well. Both of the men wore reading glasses, which we know to be true about Ishiyama and Ishinose. Yeah, but were they both skinny? Um, I think, well, probably I'd say Ishinose was skinny, but um, right. uh, when you look at Ishiyama, he looks a little bit chubby. So Mao Fook was briefly was previously debriefed in 1997. Mao Fook was adamant that the capture of the foreigners occurred in 1973 and not 1970. Mao Fook was sure the foreigners were moving east to west on National Route 1 when they were captured. He also was sure that the Japanese individual in Pakadong in 1973 was not among those that he observed in Orang O. He was also sure there was a Japanese female captured during that time. He was questioned on these points in detail on several occasions and in different ways during the debriefing. So it also says the source's comment 
concerning the Japanese journalist was in reference to sources August 2000 interview with Miss uh, Kiyono Mamiko, who was the assistant editor of Foreign News Section. Um, yeah, so the story is something that Japanese media have covered fairly extensively because they were two very famous Japanese journalists that they've been trying to resolve this case on. Yep. So, so another Japanese male source met with Vanna, a former member of the Orango messenger station a few days before to this debri debriefing. Vanna told sources that he saw a possible Japanese male being held at the Eastern Region Headquarters in Pakadong in 1973. Mr. Vanna is a Deputy District Chief of Orango District and a member of the Funisep Pek Party. So the Japanese journalist who I talked to before last week, okay, it's about Sorry, guys, the rain here is very, very heavy. Yeah, it's sounding pretty like it's raining when you get there. Yeah. What should we do, John? Can you hear me still? Oh, I hear you great. You're good. Okay, cool. Okay, Fon. So, Mr. Fon. In the early 70s, the Khmer Rouge maintained a base approximately three or four kilometers east of Pakadong village across the Chum Molu stream. In about May 1970, the local Khmer Rouge base commander, Hen Sam Kai, invited one individual from nearby Pakadong to go to a special party at the base. Because the village chief was unable to attend. Mr. Fon was de designated to go to the party. Mr. Fon added he could not remember the name of the village chief at the time, but the party, but the village chief was later executed. At the party, Mr. Fon saw a foreigner. He described the foreigner as dark-skinned like a Khmer, but he was not Khmer and he was not African. The foreigner had dark eyes, black wavy hair and a beard, and he wore green clothes and a gold watch. Mr. Fon could not tell if the clothes were military or civilian. The foreigner needed an interpreter to speak with the Cambodians, and Mr. Fon assumed the interpreter was speaking English. Mr. Fon does not speak English. Khmer Rouge personnel at the party told Mr. Fon that the foreigner had been with them for 15 days. After the party, Mr. Fon returned to his home and never saw the foreigner again. He did not know the fate of the foreigner. Mr. Fon discussed the organization of the Khmer Rouge in the area at the time of the incident. Sal Pim was a commander of the Khmer Rouge front in the area. Ta Lin was a deputy front commander. Heng Sam Kai, or Ta Kai, was the commander of the local Khmer Rouge unit. The Khmer Rouge sub-district commander at the time was Cheng Seng. He was later executed. Mr. Fon did not know the fate of any of the other former Khmer Rouge personnel. He did not know any of the Khmer Rouge station at the military base. He said they came from other areas and were not from the local village. So it it appears that they there was there was a meal had between Taizo Ishinose and some of the uh, communist soldiers before he was executed. So when he first arrived, I don't think I don't think it was all bad news when he first arrived. Okay, here we go. Again, Mr. Put Vanna, former Khmer Rouge Communist Eastern Region Messenger, Japanese American prisoner executed in Pakadong in 1973. Details of the report. You can see I have concentration of steel. I have white knives in my ears and I can still keep on reading, John. <laughs> Mr. Put Vanna, a former medic in the Khmer Communist Eastern Region Messenger Organization, had acquired the information through his personal observation and experience in the Eastern Region. Reliability has not been established. This is Stony Beach Report. It provides details on the Khmer Communist Eastern Region Messenger Network and the existence of a Japanese American prisoner at the Eastern Region headquarters in Pakadong, Kampong Cham Province, after the US bombing halt in 1973. Mr. Put Vanna was born in Tardich Village. For not commune, um, Kamsik district, Prevang province in 1950. He completed secondary school in 1970 and entered the Khmer Communist Revol Revolutionary Movement. Put Vanna received medical training under Dr. Chan Sung, deceased in the Eastern Region Hospital attached to the Eastern Region headquarters. He studied medical general practice and surgery. 
Eastern Region Messengers. In 1973, Mr. Put Banner was assigned to the Eastern Region Messenger Service under Mr. Heng Sam Kai and Mr. Mal Fook. Heng Sam Kai was the Chief of the Regional Messenger System and Chief of the Messenger Office at the Eastern Region Headquarters. Mal Fook was a Deputy Chief of the Regional Messengers and Chief of the Orang O Office. A typical messenger station was comprised of a number Chief, Deputy, a medic, and a number of messengers. The number of messengers is based on the amount of traffic at that location. Um, Mr. Put Banner was stationed with Hang Sam Kai, who was based at the Eastern Region Headquarters at Pakar Dong, to Bum Kampong Cham Province from 1973 to 1974. There were 10 messengers based at Pakadong with Put Vanna acting as their medic. Put Vanna did not know any of the other medics stationed at the other messenger offices within the Eastern Region Network. Some of the messengers at the Eastern Region headquarters included Sarat. So there's a few people there. So I mean, a few different names of the people that were stationed there at the time. Okay, so what happened? What happened to this Japanese American? So. In 1974, Mr. Put Vanna was transferred from Pakar Dong to Rocka Canal. Uh, the Rocka Canal station was accurate, actually in Prampil village, Pumprampil, and had four or five messengers. The chief of the station was Mut. So, Japanese American prisoner, about 15 days to one month after the end of the US bombing in Cambodia in 1973. The bombing halt began on 15th August 1973. Put Vanna was summoned to a hut about 200 metres north of the Pakadong village. When he arrived, he saw a prisoner. The prisoner was guarded by two Eastern Region messengers. Mr. Put Vanna could not remember their names. The prisoner's hands and feet were swollen and the source was directed to examine them. Mr. Put Vanna described the prisoner as Asian with a large build, about 1.7 metres tall, dark eyes, black wavy hair, light skin and a beard. The prisoner wore a green shirt with khaki trousers, a watch and a silver necklace with a silver Christian cross. The prisoner had a green backpack and uh, wore U.S. combat boots, U.S. military combat combat boots, which it fits with um, this photograph here, John. Yep, yeah. Of Taizo with his combat boots on. Taizo was known to wear U.S. combat boots, something that he used to do. So, so while the source was treating the prisoner, an Eastern Region political officer came to the hut with another unidentified Chinese linguist and began to interrogate the prisoner. Source speaks some English and French and was able to understand some of the conversation. Lee Samrit spoke English and French with the Japanese with the prisoner who was able to speak English, French, Chinese, and Japanese. When they asked why he came to Cambodia, the prisoner replied that he was a Japanese from America who worked for the blank. Source heard the prisoner's name but could not remember it. The prisoner was captured on National Route 1 in Svei Ring. Put Banner did not know the circumstances of the prisoner's capture. Put Vanna was directed to feed the prisoner who he saw over the course of three to four days. The prisoner readily ate most anything provided, including rice. During that time, Put Vanna saw the prisoner exercising by doing push-ups on his fingertips. After three or four days, the prisoner was taken away. Source heard that the prisoner was killed and buried near Pakadong village. So, John, any questions, sir? Nope. Nope. Just following along here. Okay, cool. So yeah. Is it it can you follow me? I am. Yeah, yeah. yeah no good, good, good. I hope I hope I'm sound. Okay, so we've been talking about Ham Sam Kai, so this is this is related to what this guy was up to. Okay. Hearsay and first-hand information on the execution and burial of a Westerner just outside Pakadong Village in the early 1970s. Pakadong Village was previously identified as Pakadong Village and possibly as Pakadong. Um, uh, Mr. Duk Chan, 
outlined his participation in the execution and burial of the Westerner. According to Mr. Chun, Mr. Samkaya, Khmer Rouge security officer he had befriended, attempted to execute the Westerner with a shot to the head, but his weapon malfunctioned. Mr. Samkaya then pushed the blindfolded Westerner into a burial pit and asked Mr. Chun and several other children to throw rocks at the victim and bury him. Mr. Chun led the organ the uh, investigation team to the burial site east of Pakadong village and specified a five by five meter area where Mr. Chun alleges that yeah where he alleges that the Westerner is buried okay so it's um it's about a, a four, it's a not far from a former communist hospital so the hospital that we've been hearing about okay mr duk chan witness two through five okay so the witnesses began by discussing the wartime organization of the Khmer Rouge forces in the area the Khmer Rouge established the headquarters near Pakadong village in early 1970. So he's talking about the command committee. Where are we? Here. So Sal Pim was the Khmer Rouge Eastern Region Secretary. Uh, okay, so uh, the witnesses did not know the Khmer Rouge designated for the camp and claimed that they had only gone to the camp after the Khmer Rouge abandoned it in 1974 and moved their headquarters into Pakadong. They heard the camp consisted of a headquarters, hospital, logistics area, and billeting for troops. During one trip into the camp after 1974, the witnesses saw many fighting positions and rows of depressions. There were two women who worked in the hospital, but they could not remember their names. During more recent trips to the camp, the witnesses noticed a nearby river and had filled in with remaining fighting positions and depressions. The Vietnamese also maintained a camp in the area. The camp was near Samrang village. The camp included a hospital and a cemetery. The Vietnamese military region commander was Mr. Ba Hai. And uh, in 1983 and 1984, the Vietnamese troops came to the area and recovered remains of their own soldiers. In January 1972, the Khmer Rouge captured a foreigner and brought him to Pakadong village. They told local villagers they captured the foreigner on National Route 7 and that he was a Japanese agent. The Japanese, the foreigner was kept in Pakadong for two days and tied to a pole in the center of the village with his legs chained together. The witnesses described the foreigner as tall and clean shaven with light skin, light colored eyes and brown hair. The foreigner wore a brown shirt, green trousers, metal framed glasses, US style jungle boots. The foreigner cried when the Khmer Rouge took his jungle boots and he refused to eat or drink. The witnesses did not know the fate of the foreigner. When asked whether the foreigner, um, Mr. Bay Fon described seeing in the nearby Khmer Rouge camp was the same one was described. The witness stated that they were two different people. So maybe that was Mr. Ishiyama was held there too but his bones haven't been recovered um let me see so in january 1972 the Khmer Rouge captured a foreigner and brought him to pakadong they told local villagers that he was an agent yeah japanese agent any questions john no sir no everything seems to be lining up with those combat boots yeah the the combat boots so let let's have a let's have some let's have a look at some photographs of taizo so this is taizo here so one of the interesting things that you can see about taizo is that his jawline wasn't symmetrical he was a baseball player and he had he damaged his jaw in some type of baseball accident he had reconstructive surgery on his jawline so um, let me see some other. i'll pull up some pictures so yeah i want to pull up some photographs and show you why um, i think that we found i found taizo so you can see here you can see down on taizo's jaw below his lip there yep that there's a cleft there's an indent there and then there's a scar, like a, a circular scar that comes up to below his lip, yep. right? So um, what that is, is that's from a um, operation 
and I'm going to show you, I recovered a portion of remains. I'd recover the right mandibular. So thankfully, I've been able to compare the right mandibular that I found to Taizo here. So let's have a look with the X, with the X-rays. Um, okay. So these are the X-rays that I found that the, the x-rays that that I took with the remains that I found. So if you can see here, I've marked with the red line here where the incision is in the face there and where it lines up with the teeth. So I'll show you one more time with this picture. Okay. Where are we? So Let's have a look when I superimpose the scar over the top of the teeth. Yep. So you can see there when I superimpose the scar over the top of the teeth that um, the scarring matches where a dental surgeon would have had to open his mouth up to do that reconstructive surgery. Surgery, surgery mark. So we're not 100% that it's Tizo that we found, but when we have a look at, say, here, and then we compare that with the shape of the relative shape of the jawbone, boom. So here, when we have a look at the picture here, where the circuit below where the, the circular incision would have been there. Mm -hmm. semicircular incision below there we can see there's a hole which has been drilled in the actual jaw as a drain for this osseous that's been surgically implanted so there's a there's a hole there drilled so if we have a look here it looks very it matches with the scarring on Tizo's face the dental surgery that we understand Taizo had matches with the specific osseous that I pulled out of the ground. So in a, a few years ago, we tested, we, we got a family reference sample from Koki Ishiyama, the Defense Intelligence Agency tested it. And yep. the results were that it was not Koki Ishiyama that we found. So it has through a pro through that process of elimination we've landed on Taizo Ishinose because he's the essentially the last candidate there's only two guys that went missing in 1973 and before that nobody had uh anybody that went missing had not returned they'd all been murdered so there was only two people that were out two Japanese that were out running around in 1973 after the bombing and one was Taizo and one was Koki Ishiyama. And the reason why I side with it being Taizo is this photograph. So you'll see here, this photograph was taken in the area of Kampong Cham. This photograph was taken by Taizo Ishinose on September 11th, 1973. It's a picture of a bound and blindfolded Khmer Rouge captive being questioned by a government soldier. And the photo by Taizo Ishinose. So Taizo had been out there and he took this photo, which was a very sympathetic photo towards the Khmer Rouge. And then he ended up getting a pass to go out into that area. Taizo was in this area taking photographs in the area where he ended up disappearing. Two months, he'd been in there in the months leading up that to it, two months before or one month before. So they went missing October 10th and September 11th, Taizo had been out in that area taking photographs. This is in the National Archives, this photograph of the United States. Yep. Um, that's where I got that photograph from, but it's good that it's been kept, that piece of history. Okay, yeah, so there's a there's the most there's the important date. So yeah. Kampong Chum, he was in Kampong Chum. That says fourteenth of the ninth, right? So actually it was taken, yeah. On the 14th okay so yeah at that time there was a whole bunch of japanese and koreans that were missing 
but these guys have been missing for a long time. We can scratch these guys off the list, right? Um, these two Koreans weren't missing in 68. And other than the two Koreans that weren't missing in 68, we have letters from the Japanese government, the Japanese Bureau of Missing People on the 27th of October, 1973. So this is even before it was reported that Taizo and Ishiyama had met, went missing when this document was sent. Memorandum, uh, government of the Japan list of missing people. The government of Japan has, re has requested the assistance of the United States delegation to obtain information about eight Japanese men missing in Indochina. So yeah, Ishinose and um, Ishinose and Ishiyama they were number nine and number ten to go missing. So these are the uh, these are the eight that were missing before they went. So we've we've listed everybody here. So that's <laughs> nice nice. here, yeah. So essentially, there's Tomoharu Ishi and. Um, the guys who went missing in the group with Sean Flynn and then some other Japanese that went missing in 1970. And so we can we can assume that all of these guys at this time, all these Japanese citizens would that are on this list were dead. And the only two that had any that were alive in the territories were Taizo and um Koki because Taizo and Koki went over on the 10th of October they had not told anybody this memorandum was sent on October the 20th so the Japanese were unaware that they had an, another two citizens that were missing here we go that's it more that's it sorry instead of having to turn your head to the left or the right John there you go so Tomoharu Ishii, he was a common man. He went missing in Takeo. Shojiro Kato, farmer, went missing in Fuklong in Vietnam. And Kira Kasaka, he, was, he went missing with Sean Flynn. Kojiro Sakai, Yujiro Takagi, Yoshihiko Waku, Take, Takeishi Yano Gisawa, Yoshihiko Yurino. So these are all the guys that, these are the Japanese citizens that were killed in uh, 1970 in cambodia or went missing they they never there was never any sign of them i think uh some of them were found but they they their bodies had been satellite after they've been killed yeah so this is just the japanese trying to find out more information on what happened to their people but as per usual they've just hit a wall again they're always hitting a wall so yeah so it's always the same about these guys getting captured and taken along Japanese mail. So, yeah, here's a list of the people that went missing. So you can see in 1972, we had Australians, Americans, Cambodians went missing. Taizo went missing in 73. So, yeah, Taizo and Koki are carried as going missing at different times but they both went missing at the same time they went missing together so they were, yeah they were working as a team when they went missing so like kind of in the way that sean and dana were working as a team great ties of photography so yeah i'm really sorry about this background noise it's it's insane but i'm uh, trying to trying to keep trying to keep focused but I, i've been able to do it so far so let's yeah. have a look a little bit more about the movement of these guys and then we're going to get to the nitty-gritty of it so yeah this is a document that i found and it's just talking about the movement of these guys between these different villages and um, so another list of missing people so a group of journalists were captured and disappeared at Eastern Chipu. Uh, those journalists were captured six kilometers near Chipu. So it says um, all the guys that were missing. So they know that there was journalists moved. Journalists were moved through Chantria, village, Kampong, Kosang village, Romi Hek, Orango, Trapang Rasay, 
and then they ended up down the bottom in Taboom Kaboom District, Kampong Chum. So Taboom Kaboom District is where the prison that um, we're, we're talking about and the hospital location was. So it says here that, um, here we go. So late 1971, we're talk this is talking about Hang Peng. 71, Khmer communists killed an American in the village hospital, region 203, located in Pakadong, Kruchma district. The foreigner was pale, had a long, thin beard. He was told, they were told that he had malaria. Tarpim, the secretary of region 203, ordered the medical practitioner to give an injection of three tubes of Largactyl to put him to death. No one knew this other than Hang Peng, a health official, the medical practitioner, and some other high-ranking officials. Following the injection, the patient fell unconscious and was immediately buried near the hospital. The source knows the place where he was buried, but did not know the exact grave because there were so many graves. After the corpse was buried, Tarpim said that the American was a journalist, but he did not mention his name or the reason for him being killed. According to the photos of foreigners disappeared in Cambodia, Hang Peng revealed that he thought the foreigner looked like Sean Flynn. So this is why I was looking for Sean Flynn out there. Yeah, that's what led place. you there. Yep. So an English-speaking journalist was de detained in Department of Region 25, located in Svetemek, and uh, the detention took place approximately June 74, March se no, June 70 to March 74, in front of the Ambil Market to the eastern side of the Basak River, possibly in Rockor Village. In late 1972, an unknown cadre living in the East Region said that he had led combatants to fight in the Hiasur battlefield and that um, he had arrested two journalists of unknown nationalities because they were there to take photos. They were then sent to the region, village authorities in Region 203. So they were sent to Pakadong. So now I'm going to read a document which goes into my operation in Pakadong. Okay. Um, there. So here, first hand information just outside Pakadong. Mr. Duk Chan outlined his participation in the burial of the Westerner about throwing the rocks. Yeah, we did that before. So we've, we've seen this one. Where are we? Okay. So executive summary. Okay. Details regarding partially excavated burial site in Pakadong. On April the 5th, 2010, source led reporting officer to the burial site in Pakadong village, Kampong Cham. The site had been partially excavated on 14th of March 2010 by David McMillan, an Australian citizen acting on behalf of family members of reference number 1588. The burial site is situated in a 20 by 20 metre area surrounded by rice fields approximately one kilometre east of Pakadong village. Source pointed out the spot where the skull fragments and teeth had been located. Source said skull bones and teeth were found in less than two metres of soil just north of the buried rocks that were used to stone the victim. Source estimated that the remaining lower body bones would be located directly to the south of where the skull was recovered. Source later led reporting officers to observe the site of the former Buddha shrine that had been dismantled by the Khmer Rouge around 1970. The former shrine was located in a rice field across the village road, 60 metres to the northwest of the burial site. One 100 centimetre by 60 centimetre laterite rock from the temple still rests on the ground. Source stated that the smaller rocks from the temple which were used to stone the victim were found in the grave site. So you'll see. Now I'm going to show you. This is the this is where I found the remains of who I think is Taizo. Oh. So you can see there, John. So yeah, it's right beside the road in the rice fields. He was thrown face first into a grave, and then he was stoned to death. So this is I have not prepared this sketch. The U.S. military prepared this sketch to explain. Yeah my excavation to their investigators. Yeah, so several other children and Mr. Chun threw rocks at the victim to bury him. Mr. Chun led them to the burial site. He also led me to the burial site. And the end result for me was the remains that I found. So um, 
let me see. Teeth. These are the teeth that I found. Yeah. You can see that um, there's... Yeah. It's pretty considerable from an evidentiary perspective to be able to pull this type of stuff out of the ground on an MIA case, isn't it, John? Oh, it definitely is. So you can see there. That's some complicated dental work for the time. For the time. Most definitely. So, yeah, you can see that there's been surgery done. They had to cut into his face to be able to implant the osseous. Here's another angle of it. So, you can see here just below, you can't really see it clearly, but there's a drill hole through one side of the jaw to the other from the back side. You can see it. There was a drill hole below the teeth there for the yeah. drain. So when we have a look at pictures of Tyzo's face, let's see. It's Tyzo there in good times, drinking a beer and his tiger striped camouflage. Looks pretty if you happy. Be drinking a beer in Vietnam, you want to be doing it in tiger stripe camouflage with your bar bar beer shirt <laughs> on. Yeah. I reckon he seemed like he was a bit of a character, a bit of a legend, Taizo. So, yeah, this is him. This is him with some southern Vietnamese troops up the top. You can see with his with his teeth, too. He had his other teeth were like, um, were synthetic material too you can see it when he's smiling his teeth look like yeah they look synthetic but yeah there's a couple of pictures of Taizo. he was only 26 years old when he went missing that's a sad that's a sad thing about it they say that he's 21 they, the reason why they say he's 21 is because he looks so bloody young yeah he's yeah this, so that's him see this is this is him cruising around so you can assume that this is probably what he looked like when he went missing out there because they said that he had his boots on, right? So combat boots and, uh, yeah, see, so he even had combat boots on there, but he had long trousers on to hide the top of the combat boots, the yep. camera. So when you look at pictures of him. I lose you there, Dave. And looks like Dave froze up there. You with me, Dave? It looks like I'm still on here. Anyway, there's a close up of uh, Tazo's face. Hopefully, Dave joins us again here. All right. Well, it looks like Dave, we lost Dave here, but uh, so what we'll do, we've been going for an hour and eight minutes here. We'll go ahead and uh, yeah, lost him there. He's going to pop back in probably here in a second. See if he comes back on. We'll give him a couple more seconds. Uh, while we're doing this, we'll uh, take a quick break and have a, a quick word from Abraham Lincoln here real quick. Four score and seven years ago, our ancestors dreamed that we would build our family tree and make fascinating discoveries about our family history. I used MyHeritage.com to embark on my journey, and I entered a few names into my family tree. MyHeritage found riches of information about my ancestors, family trees, and records galore. I colorized and sharpened old family photos and can now see them in a whole new light. My heritage even connected me with new cousins around the world, like Dave and his wife Susie. Congrats, dear boy. Call me. <laughs> Start today on MyHeritage.com and bring your family history to life, creating a lasting legacy of your family, by your family, for your family. How did I do? Be honest. <laughs> honest, Dave. There, 
um yeah so what we're going to probably do is uh bring you another uh part five we'll go ahead and discuss the rest of uh dave's discovery of the remains and and kind of where they sit now um and all the different things that he's had to go through uh since his discovery of those remains so i want to say thank you for everybody for joining us today and uh we'll have dave back next week and we'll uh finish this uh this one off on tazo and we'll also be bringing you some additional stories here in the near future uh on jerry mad dog shriver and and some others that were also lost in cambodia and uh once we finish the cambodia stuff we'll probably move on to laos so i want to say thank you to everybody for joining us and and uh we'll see you again next week